Tonight, we are very, very honored to have Caroline Dummy, who is a general counsel, to come here on Friday night, give us this talk. And thank you very much, Caroline. And it's our honor to have you. Um, before I give the floor to you, and I do wanted to mention, uh, you know, this uh, because you're from the New York State. So I wanted to give a little brief introduction of Division of Human Rights. So New York has the pro uh, proud distinct of the being the first state in the nation to enact a human rights law, which affords every citizen an equal opportunity to enjoy a full and productive life. The New York State Division of Human Rights was created to enforce this important law. And also the Carol Downey is the general counsel of this division. And we're gonna give the uh, tutor a link later or after the talk. And so we hope everyone tonight can, uh, you know, uh, join, uh, support the tutors. So this is a little background about Karen Donnie. Uh, I don't want it to reading through, but as you can see, she has long-term, uh, very experience, experience in defense, of, uh, you know, uh, in the uh, discrimination uh, ratio and a uh, all, all kind of the criminal uh, cases. So tonight, um, we're going to have actually interactive uh, conversation, similar type like interview. And also she actually offered that anytime during the talk, um, the friends and tonight's audience can type question and I will pick your question based on our conversation. We don't have to wait until the end because as if you are our audience before, you know that we always do the QA at the end. But tonight, she's, she's very, very friendly. She offered to answer the question throughout this discussion. And also, okay, so now, um, and also uh, I wanna say that the caring is super, super busy as you can see. Uh, so, but tonight, since I mentioned that our community might need some guidance, so it's like she was actually pulled the last minutes and pulled a great slide for us. So here is her slides. Um, I also want to mention that tonight's audience, many of you might come from different states. Um, even tonight's talking about uh, she's from the New York State. However, the human rights issues, it's common in different states. And also the um, resource, uh, the definition, the concept, and uh, the experience that she mentioned here, not just apply to New York, right? And uh, she's also can apply, apply to the nationwide. But because different state might be have a different, uh, you know, the uh, legal process, uh, you might consult uh, the local uh, legal counsel. But uh, the knowledge should be also common. Uh, so, okay, so I'm going to start the slideshow. And Karen, thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you so much, Angeline. And I'm, I'm really delighted to be here. Um, it's the first time I've ever given a talk at nine o'clock on a Friday night, and I think it's great. Um, I, I saw your vision here of your organization, and I'd like to thank you and your organization for, for doing what you do. And the vision, uh, the vision piece that you put forward really, um, really aligns very closely with what we do with the Division of Human Rights and what New York State, uh, by, uh, by having the human rights law, um, is is uh, wants uh, to accomplish are, are very similar kinds of goals. If you want to put the next slide down, Angeline, if you would. Okay. Thank you. So as Angeline mentioned, New York was the first state in the United States to have an anti-discrimination law that it had an enforcement arm to it. And it went all the way back to 1945. So that was a time in this country and elsewhere where discrimination and, and uh, was actually written into laws in many states. And New York became the first state uh, to, uh, to prohibit discrimination. It started, uh, the, the original was employment discrimination and the bases covered in those days was uh, race, national origin and creed. So it's expanded over the years uh, to be very broad. And I'm gonna talk about what we cover and uh, uh, in terms of our jurisdiction and what kinds of discrimination we cover with respect to our jurisdiction as we go forward. As Angeline mentioned, um, I, 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 this is a New York state law and it's only uh, enforceable for the residents of New York state 
or for discrimination that may occur in New York State, even if you live elsewhere, but it has to actually occur here. Uh, but it's largely for the, for the residents of New York State. Um, however, it, we do have, uh, it, there are federal laws that are, are very similar to New York law, and I, I will talk a little bit about where, where they differ. Um, so the whole country, uh, certainly the federal laws apply to, and those that's Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, which is enforced by the EEOC, that's employment discrimination, and the Fair Housing Act, which is enforced by HUD, uh, the uh, Housing and Urban Development uh, Department, and that is um, uh, the, the uh, housing end of it. So uh, most of these protections are are covered under federal law as well. And certainly in many states, um, if you were in California, for example, very similar law to New York. Um, in, in fact, in some ways it may have some even broader aspects to it, but New York is about as, as, as um, broad as it can get, not as it can get, but it, as it, it, it is across the country. And I'm going to mention a few places where the law has really expanded just in the last couple of years um, that has made such a difference for, for so many people. So it's in Article 15 of the executive law. We have our website. You just Google um, in Division of Human Rights and it'll bring it up. Uh, it, we have many, many publications there that will mirror and expand upon some of the things I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, and uh, so I do, uh, I'm not going to cover everything. And it, it, it's, a, it's a big, broad law, uh, but uh, there's a lot more information for you, of course, on our website. And I just, this is an important piece. It's in the human rights law that it's, that the, the law itself is an exercise of the police power of the state, which is important. It, it is a remedial law. It's part of the police power to protect the welfare of the people of New York and discrimination harms the welfare, health and peace of the people of New York. And I think that's an important thing to bear in mind when we think about you know, employment discrimination or housing discrimination or the other kinds that we'll be talking about. It, it's sort of a, a broader concept you have to look at and what discrimination really does and the damage that it really does. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so I wanna talk about our areas of jurisdiction. Um, and, and so these are the, the kinds of entities that we cover. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of these bullets as I, as I go along. So we cover employment and that is our largest area of um, jurisdiction. When I say cover, and I'm gonna talk about this more at the end of the program, but I want you to know that we are a complaint driven agency, which means People, anybody who is a resident of New York or if discrimination happens in New York can file a complaint in our agency and we have offices all over the state and I'll get in a little later about uh, how you can get an, a complaint form online and file it, et cetera. Um, but it, it, you, people file complaints with us. We investigate those cases. We have trials on those cases if needed and we can award any kind of damages to make the complaining party whole where we find there's been discrimination. So um, it, it, you I want you to know that sort of going in and I'll give a little more detail of it, but that, that's what we do. So when I talk about these areas of jurisdiction, we cover all these areas, that's where our jurisdiction is. And then I'm gonna talk in a couple of slides about um, the, the kinds of discrimination. We, as I said, we started with race, national origin and creed, but it's way expanded beyond that now, all these years later, over 75 years later. So uh, employment is our biggest area of jurisdiction. That's the, the area upon which more complaints are filed. And by the way, we get, it, it's, it's changed a little because of the pandemic, but we, we averaged before the pandemic, and I think we'll be back to it, about 6,000 complaints a year. So that's a lot. <laughs> Uh, we also can bring our own complaints if we find a, 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 um, a pattern of discrimination that, that perhaps nobody's brought to our attention, uh, we can bring our own complaints as well. Those tend to be um, larger concepts of, of kinds of discrimination that we wanna, that we wanna get at. But we, we want people to file complaints with us. It's free, you don't need an attorney. Uh, there, it's um, it, it's a very user friendly 
Um, we do the investigations and an attorney is assigned uh, if your case goes to trial. So it, it's, it's really a, a user-friendly kind of system and we want to encourage people to do it. We, we, we want to get back up to 6,000 complaints a year. Most of them, as I say, are in employment. And that includes any kind of employment in the state except federal employment. We don't cover that. Uh, but public or private doesn't matter. It includes employment agencies, which you know can steer people uh, perhaps to one kind of job or another, and it might be based on their national origin and their race or their sex or whatever it might be. Um, that those are those are covered as well, and then unions are covered as well. In the early days of the human rights law, there was quite a lot of discrimination. Uh, with respect to unions and apprenticeship programs, how people get into getting well-paid jobs, uh, that's certainly much less so, but we still, of course, cover unions in that. And the next little semi-bullet there, it, we cover, and this is quite amazing, really, all employers in the state, even if there's only one employee. Now, to qualify under federal law, uh, as, as your, the employer, in order for a complaining party to bring a complaint, um, under federal law, you're, the employer has to have at least 15 employees. So you see, we cover many, many more employers. Um, most of the time, and, until three years ago, most of the time I've worked here, which is a long time, um, the, uh, we needed four or more employees, but now it's only one. So even, and, and this perhaps isn't such a, a big issue here in the city, uh, employment tends to, employers tend to be a little larger, but certainly Certain things like uh, it, it, it has quite an impact. Things like doctor's offices might only have two or three employees. Um, if there's only one employee, that's enough for us to have jurisdiction under the human rights law. This just changed and it's a big, uh, it's a big huge change. So all employment. And when we talk about the kinds of things uh, that are, are unlawful in employment, it's hiring, firing, promotion, all terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. You have to be treated just like everybody else in your job, get paid the same. Equal pay is very much a part of something that we cover. Um, we cover harassment in all areas and, and it's sex harassment certainly, but uh, harassment based on any of our other categories of, of race or national origin or creed or disability or whatever it may be. And harassment, I'm gonna talk about a little bit because again, that has been greatly expanded uh, in recent years, uh, the coverage of that. So um, though, though it, that's, that is an, our employment in, in a nutshell. There's a lot more to it, but I don't want to spend too much time on any one piece. Housing is another large part of our jurisdiction. About 10% or so of our jurisdiction is housing, but it's very, very important. And we, we would like to see more housing, and we'd like to see less housing discrimination, but we know it's out there. So we'd like to see more housing complaints. Again, this is public housing, publicly assisted housing, private housing. Um, we, the only limitation is if it's a two family owner occupied kind of house. So if it's a house that is owned by the, uh, uh, the where one unit is, is lived in by the owner, and another by a tenant, then that's not covered by our law, but any other kind of housing is. And again, that happens to be, uh, that has more coverage than federal law with, res with respect to that. What, you know, we see the kind, you know, examples of the things we see um, are, uh, and, and I wanted to point out everyone, everyone having anything to do with housing is, a, is potentially liable under this law. So real estate agents, real estate professionals, salespeople of real, real estate, a managing agents of a, of a, of a building, um, and of course, owners and anybody having the right to rent or sell the building. Uh, but real estate, uh, it's very important. I don't know if any of you followed the Newsday articles out on Long Island, where there was such rampant um, steering of people based on their race or national origin. Um, so that realtors would say, well, you know, they'd only show houses in certain neighborhoods to certain people. Uh, that is unlawful. It's hard for people to know that that's going on because they're given a group of houses. They don't know who else is getting what houses. Um, so that's where we often use and, and um, housing advocacy organizations use testers for those kinds of circumstances 
so that they can determine whether discrimination has gone on. And again, all the kind of harassment uh, provisions apply with, with respect to housing, with respect to any of these areas that, I, that I'm going to be talking about. So um, the next area of our jurisdiction is places of public accommodation. And this is just anything that's open to the public. So it's, you know, hotels, restaurants, the kinds of things, you know, you think of as an accommodation, but it's also things like hospitals and medical clinics and doctor's offices, um, those kinds of areas as well. Um, again, broadly interpreted, the law itself is to be broadly interpreted so uh, that it, it is anything that's open to the public. Um, and that includes things as I get into disability, things like accessibility so that people can, uh, who may use a wheelchair or have other issues relative to mobility can get into a store or into a restaurant and, and those kinds of, of areas. We cover educational institutions, both public and private, all educational ex except for those that are religious in nature. So a Catholic school, or a Jewish school or something like that would not come in under that. But this goes to access to educational institutions. We, we cover them in employment as well. But um, that, that is a very a broad area of our law and one that has been expanded recently as well. And then credit is an important area. It's often considered in terms of housing, but equal credit is extremely important to uh, people being able to, to, to get the things they need, including housing. And uh, you know, so credit can, has to be offered equally. It can't be different based on where you live or what your race or national origin or sex is or anything like that. Um, the next slide, please, Angela. I'm just gonna talk about these very briefly because this is the rest of our area of jurisdiction. I just wanted to be complete. So we cover insurance in, in a limited way. We cover licensing and professional for professional occupational licenses, which is very important because uh, being able to get licensed, whether it's you know a hairdressing license or a barber's license or a real estate license or a medical license, has to be done equally. Obviously, the qualifications have to be there, uh, but the qualifications uh, have to be considered separately from any of the protected classes under the human rights law. Uh, blacklisting, boycotting, that really um, goes to uh, refusing to uh, do business with um, someone because of a national origin or, or race or religion, that kind of thing. And then volunteer firefighters just happens to be a separate section under our law, but that's covered as well. Next slide. So I did want to talk about the, um, the, the bases, and I, I, talk, I said before, there were federal parallels uh, to, to uh, most of these. And uh, these are the ones that have uh, federal parallels. Um, and I'm gonna talk about each of these just a little bit in terms of what it means and, and what, what the coverage is for these kinds of areas. So as you know, the, the first one wa uh, that was, uh, the first three there were, were the big three that were added in uh, with respect to employment in 1945. Uh, and it's, um, they certainly remain in every area of the law. And, and race and color have ne are not defined in the law. Uh, it's, it's um, um, a, there's no particular standard for, for determining an individual's racial identity. Self-identification is, um, is what is, is used when people file with us. Uh, color can be a separate uh, category. Uh, based on the color of the person's skin, uh, it, which may differ in, in, for the race. And again, uh, self-identification uh, with a particular national or ethnic group or, uh, it, it, is, is what is key here. There was a recent amendment, so the, the, so the race is not defined in the human rights law, uh, and it hasn't really needed to be, but there was an amendment uh, a couple of years ago that uh, hairstyles that are associated with race um, are, are not, are, it's discrimination to make uh, determinations based on somebody's hairstyle if it's a hairstyle that is, is associated with race. Um, the, the, the next one that was such a, um, uh, that, that goes back to 45 
is national origin. And that is defined in the law as including ancestry. So oh, it says national origin, which would mean, you know, would sound as though it means that you were born in a country other than the United States, but you don't have to be born there. Your ancestors can have been, uh, can come from there. And if you're discriminated against because of your ancestry based, that's considered uh, based on national origin and, or, or ethnicity. Uh, again, self-identification is um, what is, is key. And again, like all the human rights law, it, it's interpreted broadly so that if um, th there are citizenship requirements, for example, there are sometimes for, and there, there are certainly requirements um, for ability to work in this country, federal requirements relative to uh, employment, et cetera. But you know, citizenship, if it's, uh, we, we saw that during, uh, we've seen in housing circumstances where uh, housing providers will uh, try to insist that people be citizens and there's just no basis for that. And even though it, it really isn't the nature of national origin discrimination, because clearly if the origin, if they were American uh, of, in, or born in the United States, born here, then that would be uh, their national origin would be different from the one they might have. So again, broadly interpreted uh, in, in that sense. Um, the next slide, please. Oh, no, not yet. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you. Uh, so just to continue with national origin, again, any terms, conditions, privilege of employment um, and, and harassment, retaliation, that kind of thing. The um, One of the issues that comes up sometimes with national origin are language requirements, both in terms of fluency and in terms of people speaking a different language on the job. And um, fluency in English, if it's required, can be a job requirement if it's related to the job. And, but requiring that person speak English as his or her primary language or as a native speaker of English is discriminatory. So that that is not that would be a national origin discrimination. And, and the only lawful requirement is whatever level of English proficiency is required for the job. So it, it has to be related to the job. The, the other side of that or a little different aspect of that is um, speaking another language other than English um, on the job or in the workplace and uh, requiring employees to only speak English at all times in the workplace that may also be national origin discrimination and any rule about speaking uh, English in the workplace only or not speaking another language in the workplace um, has to be reasonable and necessary to the conduct of the business. So it, it has to have a reason for it, customer, you know, to speak to customers or whatever it may be. Um, and any kind of rule like that has to be clearly communicated to the employees so that people aren't criticized for speaking their own language among themselves when it's not necessary for, for, the, um, for the conduct of the business, as I said. So uh, the next one I wanted to talk about a little bit was creed and creed is, is, is religion, but it's called creed in the human rights law. So it, it encompasses uh, membership in an organized religion or not. Um, it, it includes just a belief in a, a supreme being. It can include having no religion or being atheistic or agnostic. Again, self-identification as to religion is, is uh, what is key. Um, there is a narrow exception for religious employers the, who can hire people and, and who can hire people of their religion um, if, if, um, if they are religious in nature, a religious institution, I mean. And um, one of the big areas in, in, in terms of, of religious or creed discrimination is that there, there's a, um, a requirement, an active requirement that employers um, reasonably accommodate religious needs. So uh, if, if people need time off to observe a Sabbath or other religious observance, or if they wear particular religious garb, um, then that should be accommodated to the extent that it doesn't cause an undue hardship on the employer. And in the human rights, I'm not gonna get into it in depth here, but it goes into 
uh, when that would would be the case. Uh, and and uh, time off for Sabbath observance um, is something that we've seen cases on for a long time. Uh, and it, again, the, the employer still has to be able to run its employment, uh, but there are usually ways of, of dealing with it. it is, it's time off based, it isn't time off that other people don't get. You have to use accruals and that kind of thing for it. Um, but it, it, it is, you know, people should not have to stay at their workplace when their religion would require them to be elsewhere. Our country sort of set up that Saturday and Sunday are days off for many people, but that's not how everybody's religion works. Um, and and uh, that's, you know, that's the kind of case we see in that regard. Um, so sex is a, is a big area. It wasn't added till 1964. Um, so not, you know, almost 20 years after the first one, just around the time that the federal law was changed. And um, again, it's, it's, um, it it's encompasses uh, pregnancy as, as sex discrimination and, and has in New York since the 1970s, the early 1970s, uh, pregnancy discrimination was considered sex discrimination. Um, and there are now separate uh, pregnancy related condition protections under the human rights law just in the last couple of years. Uh, so it, which was always really there, but the law is now explicit about, about it. And then I do want to talk a little bit about um, harassment and sexual harassment and other kinds of harassment. As I said, all harassment is covered by the human rights law. Sexual harassment may be the one we hear about the most and is certainly in the news the most, but we have seen all kinds of harassment based on all these uh, categories over the years. But I'll talk about it in terms of, of sex harassment. So this, this law was changed in, um, in 2019 to make it much easier to prove a case of harassment. And it used to be that the harassment would have to be shown to be either severe or pervasive. And that often eliminated a lot of harassment that didn't meet those standards. So now the standard is not severe or pervasive, but it's anything that it interferes with a person's work and that is more than trivial, basically. And so we are seeing a lot more cases. We're seeing a lot more cases go to a trial um, because these are things that shouldn't be happening in the workplace. Again, all kinds of, you know, all kinds of harassment, a lot of sex harassment, but all kinds. And these are, these are things that the employers have to train. In fact, it's required in New York that all employers train on sexual harassment. And um, these, these are things that shouldn't be happening and we know still are happening. So it's much easier to, to prove a sex harassment case. Um, sexual orientation, which is defined as being homosexual, heterosexual, asexual, or, or bisexual in, in the uh, human rights law that was finally, that was passed in 2002. So it's 20 years now. It was not one of the first states to, to have that. Many other states had uh, sexual orientation as um, uh, covered, but I think it's you know quite accepted now that that is not something that can be a basis for any kind of discrimination. Just two years ago, gender identity or expression, which is a, a different matter, and so that goes to um, a person's expression of, of gender, uh, which may or may not be the same as the gender assigned at birth. Um, and um, I, I'll, I'll read you the definition because it's a good one. Gender identity or expression means a person's actual or perceived gender related identity, appearance, behavior, expression, or other gender related characteristic, regardless of the sex assigned to that person at birth, inclu birth including but not limited to the status of being transgender. As this is a new area, we've, put, we've published a, a lengthy guidance on this that's available uh, if you go to our website. Um, age is another category under the human rights law. And again, we protect more than the federal law does because the federal law covers people 40 and over. We cover people 18 or over. So there can be discrimination either vis-a-vis -vis people in their 30s versus people in their 20s, or sometimes we'll have people in their 20s who are discriminated against for being too young. Now, experience and youth, um, you know, or sometimes, you know, there's sometimes lack of experience that goes with youth, but not always. So it can be something that is um, 
that is uh, covered even over 18. Disability is a huge area of our law. Of these, by the way, um, you know, it, it, it divides and, and that things are brought on to a more than one basis sometimes, but disability has always been about a third of, of our cases. It's a very broad definition of disability under the human rights law, a, a good broad definition. And again, as in creed, there's a reasonable accommodation requirement in all areas of the human rights law, uh, but particularly in employment and housing where it's spelled out um, so that people uh, who have disabilities can be accommodated if they can do, for example, the essential functions of their job, but they need, um, they need some kind of accommodation in order to do so. So that's again, something we see a lot of accommodation cases. So that goes both to being able to get into the place as, as I mentioned earlier, but also adjustment to work schedules, um, uh, uh, whatever might be needed to permit the person to, to do a job uh, that they can otherwise do. And the next one there is predisposing genetic characteristics. We have not seen many cases like that, but it would be unlawful to discriminate on that basis. Then the last one down here, and this is what's all the fe federal parallels, retaliation is really, um, really huge. That, that is if an employer, say, or a housing provider, whomever, retaliates against you for having complained about discrimination, or having filed a complaint about discrimination. And the reason that's unlawful is because we want people to complain about discrimination. And if, they're, if, they, if action is taken against them that is negative, then they're less inclined to do so. And uh, so retaliation itself is a, a, a cause of action under the human rights law and under federal law and every other law there is because it doesn't work if you can get fired for complaining, right? That, that, would, that would be a very bad result. So retaliate, we'll sometimes have cases where the complaining party wins the retaliation clay case, even though she can't prove the underlying case for whatever reason. Uh, but they, you still, if, if somebody makes the complaint, the employer, the housing provider, the place of public accommodation still can't uh, take any adverse action or retaliate against the person. Okay, next slide. Here, I don't want to be running out of time. So these are the other bases where there are no federal parallels. Um, marital status, which is just the status of being married, single, divorced, or widowed. Um, the next two are important. I'm not going to go into them in depth here, but there's a lot of protection in the human rights law for people who, in the first one, these are uh, those are situations where people have. Um, had been arrested, but it, it was resolved in their favor, or or their or sealed records or youthful offender a status. Um, this applies to uh, all uh, uh, employment and housing under the human rights law, including volunteer positions, and um, that. So that's where you know it's been resolved in the person's favor, as I say, under those circumstances. Where a person has been convicted, which is the next bullet down. Uh, so in the first one, employers can't ask about that or uh, housing providers can't ask about arrest records or anything like that. They can't ask and they can't discriminate. The conviction records where there's been a conviction, employers can ask about that. And then um, people have to be truthful in answering, but then they have to, where there's been an actual conviction, but then the employer has to weigh whether there's a connection between the job and the and the uh, offense, whether there's a, um, a, you know, how old the person was, if somebody, you know, stole hubcaps or stole a car when they were 17 or 18 and the person's now 40 and, you know, had all sorts of great jobs and rehabilitated, et cetera, that's not going to be a good reason. Rehabilitation is something to be considered. And really that it's, it's the policy of New York to encourage uh, that people with criminal conviction records can get jobs, uh, that it, that's how it's supposed to work. So that's an important part of our, um, of our law. Military status, again, that's, that's as you can imagine, you can't discriminate on that basis. Domestic violence victim status is, is a newish area, um, but one that's very important. Familial status, which means whether you have children under 18, uh, that, that um, is uh, something that is protected under the law with respect to employment and housing. 
And then this last one here, source of income, this is only in housing, but it's a really important addition to our law in the last couple of years. So that people who have some kind of housing assistance, whether it is um, a, a Section 8 voucher or any other kind of housing assistance, public, uh, you know, municipal, federal, state, whatever it might be, uh, and, and then, or other kinds of income such as um, child support income or income from after a divorce maintenance, uh, social security, source of income that isn't related to, um, to uh, wages that is protected and housing providers can't deny people housing because obviously they have to be able to meet whatever the rent is, but it's if that can be done with a voucher or these other kinds of assistance, people cannot use that as an excuse not to uh, rent to people. And that used to be rampant, it's now unlawful. So those are that, that's really where the law is. I don't know, and I, wanted, I do wanna get to discussing a little in my remaining 10 minutes or so, uh, what our process is, but I'd be happy if you had a, a question um, 